Jonathan Danny Douglas is our speaker of this hour. He and his wife, Barney, have two children, and they are with us as well, and we uh, appreciate them coming and always enjoy them being with us. <clears throat> Brother Danny is now preaching for the Beardstown congregation in Tennessee. He has done local works here in the United States, several states, along with doing mission work. He speaks on gospel meetings and lectureships. He has been an editor of the paper Standing Fast. I don't think you're publishing that anymore, but you need to. <laughs> that's, uh, see, that's a good way to chastising for letting it uh, slip and to get him on the ball and publishing that again. He does some excellent writing though. Uh, his, and we've enjoyed his preaching in times past. His subject, back, back to biblical preaching. And that is so needed in our world today and even in the church. To know that he's going to do an excellent job on it. And I'm even going to allow him to use my big pulpit over there. So, Christ, 
had in view of the judgment day. We as preachers need to consider when we step into the pulpit, we need to consider that we will be judged for what we preach, and yes, even for what we may neglect to preach. If someone is sad, there will be a lot of preachers lost because of what they did not preach. Now, as we think about this day, preaching us elders need to take heed. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, we learn that a preacher is to take heed to himself and his life and to the doctor to be sure that he is truly living and preaching and teaching the pure doctrine of Jesus Christ. As Paul said, Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. My friends, when I preach, I want to help you be saved. But surely I want to be able to save myself. And we as preachers need to think about that. But then also we wouldn't have so many problems with preachers if elders were doing what Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 verse 28. And I'm thankful we have God and el elders here among us. But he says, Take ye therefore among take ye therefore unto your son to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God which you have purchased with his own blood. Elders are to take heed to themselves, and the implication is they also are to take heed to the doctrine, because how else can the flock of God be fed? And here we see that Paul underscores the importance of the work of the bishop or elder in reminding them of the purchase price of the church, the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. And by the way, that is also a statement for the deity of Jesus Christ right there. But oh, today we have so many elders and preachers who are neglecting this morning. But the Word of God is that which builds us up and helps us to get to heaven. In fact, we can't get to heaven without it. Paul said to those same elders as he addresses them, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. But I found in the land. We know that physical famine brings physical weakness, and yes, even that. But a lack of the Word of God brings spiritual weakness, spiritual sickness, and death. As the prophet said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Oh, how appropriate the book of Amos is in our day and age today. In the brotherhood of this great land of ours has already been mentioned in this lectureship, and what fine lessons we have already had. Just a few lessons in the lectureship. What great lessons. But what a famine we have in this land and in the brotherhood. Because God's people have rejected the word of God, the Lord said to Amos, Behold, the days come, said the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And brethren, today we know that congregations, preachers, and elders have brought a famine on the church because of such a scarcity of the Word of God. But then the song of the Bible is an open invitation for error to come in. This was a great problem for the Sadducees and their many misunderstandings, paramount of which was their denial of the resurrection. Jesus pinpointed their problem. He said in Matthew 22, verse 29, You therefore do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Would you say that's a problem today? And why we have so many errors in the brotherhood of the church? People do not know the Word of God, and hence they are not familiar, do not know the power of God, the true power of God. Error has crept into many congregations. Oh yes, the preacher there, he may be drawing crowds, he may have good numbers, he may be a trained speaker, and that's what a lot of these colleges are doing now. They're trained good speakers, but they are not trained gospel preachers. They are teaching people how to give fancy speeches. But fancy speeches, stable stories, drama, and so forth are no substitute for the Word of God. We know that there are many who will desire these things over the Word of God. After charging Timothy to preach the word in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, Paul warned Timothy. And oh, how appropriate this morning is to us today in 2 Timothy 4 and 3 and 4. 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers out of itching ears, and they shall throw away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto pleasures. There is absolutely no substitute for the Bible. Back when I was doing full-time mission work about 10 years ago, I visited a congregation that was supporting my working fund, and I was there on the Lord's Day morning, and the preacher was teaching the Bible class. And I thought, well, when are we going to turn to the Bible? You know, he did not use one single scripture in that Bible class. So I thought, we cannot let a so-called Bible class in without any Bible. So before it was over, I spoke up and made an application using the scripture. I quoted the scripture. Because there was no Bible in that Bible class until that happened. We know that it's a question of spiritual nourishment or malnutrition. That's one reason it's great to have these Bible lectureships with sound men like we have this week. We want to again commend the Bellevue congregation, the elders, the preacher, and all the members for doing this. Jesus teaches us how that the Word of God feeds the soul. It nourishes, it vitalizes, and strengthens. As he answered Satan in Matthew 4, verse 4, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And again, Acts 20, verse 32, the word is able to build you up and give you inheritance among all them which are sanctified. And Hebrews chapter 4, 12 teaches us that the word of God is living and powerful. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing you the vital son of soul and spirit of joints and marrow, and is a deserter of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We know that the Bible is powerful if we will preach it. Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, there are more ways. There is a way that a congregation can be dead and appear very alive. Many times today, people think, well, if the congregation is getting a lot of numbers, and they have a building program, and they have a big staff, and they've got a large budget, they're really alive and doing well. But you remember what the Lord said about the church of Sardis? They had a name that they lived, but they were really dead. Revelation 3.1. That was the Lord's analysis of the situation. And so today in that life, we have a lot of congregations that appear to be thriving and alive, but really they are dead spiritually because they do not have the words of Jesus Christ in the congregation being preached and taught and defended and practiced. We know that Peter and the other apostles refused to turn back after many did in John 6, and Peter gave the answer, For thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art thy Christ, the Son of the living God. And beloved, we have to believe that and be sure and confident that, like Peter and the apostles were, if we're going to stand firm in the conflict today that we are involved in. Moreover, we know what Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Oh, what a beautiful thing it is to see a little baby hungry for its mother's milk. I remember going to in Moses. I ain't really hungry after his mother's milk and fed on that. That's a natural thing, isn't it? Isn't it unnatural for one who claims to love God and be a true child of God not to hunger for the Word of God? Peter said, as newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And they became the joy and the rejoicing of my soul. Perhaps here a reference to the finding of the law and the repairance of the temple. For Jeremiah said that he ate them. He took them in to his heart, mind, and soul. And he fed upon them. And they became a joy and rejoicing to him. Brethren, I know what it's like to be lonely. Um, that is, for you, yourself, for you and your family and congregation. 
If you meet lonely when you're out there and got so many problems in the congregation, but remember, you've always got a friend in the Lord. He's also got the Bible to be your companion, like Jeremiah did. Jeremiah was one of the loneliest characters that we could ever read about. But he said the words of God became the joy and the rejoicing of his soul. He lived close to God and to his word. Now here's something else for us to think about, too. When the Bible is not emphasized in a congregation, then it curbs the spiritual appetite. But on the other hand, if the Bible is emphasized by the preachers and teachers and elders and members of the church, it whets the spiritual appetite. It causes people to want to learn more, to become interested in learning more Bible topics. You can tell when you go into a congregation and have a gospel meeting sometimes and you start using the scripture and people start uh, getting distracted. I won't say go to sleep at this point. They'll start, you know, getting distracted, they'll start getting bored and all of this. Or someone may come up to you and say, you know, that was so refreshing. I heard more Bible in this meeting or today than I have heard in years in this congregation. And so when you've got a congregation where the Bible is not being preached and taught, it dulls the spiritual senses of the members. But Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But the Bible and the powerful preaching thereof purifies. The Word of God is an antidote to sin and is the key to overcoming temptation. Uh, Brother John, in his good lesson this morning, had a reference to Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, verse 9, David said, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking ye thereto according to thy word. Isn't it wonderful to see all the age groups represented here today during this lectureship? So encouraging to see young people here and taking notes and listening attentively. These are words that you can take into your heart and your life. That God's word will cleanse your way. It will keep you from many of the spiritual disasters and downfalls that so many young people have incurred because they did not take heed to the Word of God. And then in verse 11, David made an interesting statement there, inspired of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This reminds me of a story one time of a young man who came of age and it was time to go out from home. And his mother wrote these words in the front of his Bible. She wrote, only this book will keep you from sin. And only sin will keep you from this book. What a true statement she made there. The Word of God will help us to overcome. Jesus said, now you are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. In an age of worldliness and false doctrine are having such a halo in the church of our Lord. The Word of God is, able, is that which is able to keep the church pure and holy without blemish and without spot, which, according to Ephesians chapter 5, is the Lord's desire for His precious body. For that body of which He is the head of the Savior, Ephesians 5, 23, and in which the statement is made in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. You know, sin and error are running around throughout the land. And even in the brotherhood, I, I really, I'm not, I don't have the, um, the years on me that some brethren here may have, but I'm older than a lot too. Yeah, I don't remember an age when we've ever had so much flagrant error in the church, not in my lifetime, but you probably have to agree with that. So we have right now. But this error and sin can we come out and undefeated by the Word of God. For the very reason that Paul said when he described it in the Christian order of Ephesians 6 17, that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Do we realize that as preachers, when we go into the pulpit or when we teach people and whatever the same, 
Do we really, in a sense, have a greater responsibility than the surgeon at the surgeon's table? If he makes a mistake, he may cause a person many physical problems. He might even cost them their life. But if we teach the wrong thing, we could cause a person to lose their soul eternally. But on the other hand, in our teaching, we may cause a person to have eternal life in heaven someday. We have our woes and troubles as preachers and elders and even members of the church. But, beloved, it's worth it all when we think about what is to be gained. Not only for our souls, but those souls that we are striving, striving to win to Christ and to lead to heaven. We must never, ever give up. But preaching and teaching from the Bible involves warning and rebuke. There are some people that seem to have the idea that, uh, you know, if you're preaching, everything's all positive. You don't ever mention any negatives. One of the greatest preachers that ever lived, though, he warned people to do. He said, By the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone that night and day with tears. Acts 20, verse 31. And one even greater than him, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, how many times did he use this expression, Take heed, take heed. And beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raped in wolves, Jesus said in Matthew 7 15. Paul said to beware of dogs in Philippians 3, verse 2. Imagine that. What strong language. A lot of people today would condemn Paul for such, wouldn't they? We know that Jesus Christ warned against false doctrine. But in vain they worship any teachings or doctrines or commandments of uh, men. Now I want to say something right here today. We've got some brethren today, in fact, quite a few that have and have had for a good while a name for being sound. But yet there are certain subjects that they're not going to touch with a ten foot pole. They are just not going to warn about certain things. In this new politically correct new form of compromise since 2005. And uh, I, I got to think about this. I was talking to a good brother recently. And he used the illustration of Normandy, the Battle of Normandy in World War II. All along the French coastline, there were places that the Allies could have set up their weaponry and done their battle. But they met the points of contention and conflict where the enemy was serving. Now, it would not matter how many fronts they set up along the the coastline of France, if they had ignored those points of conflict and contention, that battle would have been lost to Hitler and the Axis powers. And could we say that any soldier or leader in the, the Allies, Britain or the United States, or any other countries on our side at that time, if they had neglected because of cowardice or weakness, to deal with the hot spots and the points of contention along the French coastline, do you think they would have been worthy of a Medal of Honor? Regardless of how tenaciously they may have fought in places where the battle was not raging, we need to think about that today. We've got preachers who claim to be soldiers of Christ, but they are ignoring certain errors and errors and false teachers. We must convict people of their sins. The great example of this is in Acts 2, in verse 36, where Peter there indicted the Jews for crucifying Jesus, the Lord of Christ. He said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus, and he had crucified both the Lord and Christ. Peter there told them exactly what they did. As a result of this, their hearts were pricked. This reminds us of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7 10. He said, For God is our work of repentance and of salvation, not to be repented of, that is, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world work of death. It is the preaching of the Word of God that pricks the heart of man and causes him to be broken hearted over his sin and produces that godly sorrow. 
And when they asked me to brother, what shall we do? What did Peter say? The first thing out of his mouth was, repent. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. In Acts verse 38, chapter 2, verse 38. We must convict people of their sins. Over in the book of Isaiah, the 58th chapter, verse number 1, God said through the prophet, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sin. Of course, there's a Hebrew parallelism there. Show my people their transgression in the house of Jacob their sin. We run across that a lot in the Old Testament. We see the power and the beauty of it. Not only is it a very impressive statement, but it emphasizes in the double way what we need to do. We need to show people their transgression and their sins. Give them warning from me, God said through the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 3, in verse number 17. Indeed, we are to warn. Preaching Christ involves warning. Paul said of preaching Christ in Colossians 1, 28, in whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Notice that last phrase there, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What does this imply to us? It implies that we must teach, but also we must warn. For if we do not warn every man, then he cannot be complete according to Paul's teaching. And we all need warning because we're human beings. And congregations that are not hearing anything negative, but all positive, and never being warned about anything, they have an inadequate spiritual body. They are not going to be complete spiritually if the words of Paul are true here, and indeed, they are. Jesus went to the Scriptures. We've got a lot of people today, they claim that they want to be like Jesus. Oh, how they love Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. But yet, they don't use the Word of God like Jesus did. These are just a few references among many in the New Testament. Luke 24 and 27, after the resurrection, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Expound, of course, is to explain thoroughly, to interpret. And, of course, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, to whom Jesus appeared. And, of course, he concealed his true identity to them until he disappeared out of their sight, and they recognized him there at the end as he went out of their sight. But they said, after the Lord departed from the presence on that day, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened us the scriptures? That's a good detection of the spiritual mind of person. When one can hear the Word of God and study it and his heart burned within him. When the Scriptures are being expounded and explained. You know, in that case, we have a lot of dead members of the church. We have a lot of dead congregations. Because their hearts are not burning within them for the Word of God. Then in verse 45, note this here. Then opened he, that is Christ, opened their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. Friends, we realize that this is the way that the Lord opened the heart of Lydia in Acts chapter 16. Is when Paul and the brethren expounded to her the scriptures, the Lord opened her heart. Isn't this a powerful way of teaching us what we need to be doing? We need to be opening people's minds and understanding in their hearts by plainly, powerfully, and clearly teaching God's Word and expounding it. The New Testament preachers, others, rely heavily on the Bible. In Acts 17, verse 2, Paul, as his matter was, that is, his custom, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. This was in the synagogue of us on Acts. While many want to put down proof text preaching, New Testament preachers used scripture texts to prove their points. There was Peter using Joel and David and Acts 2. 
There was Paul here in Acts 17 and Apollos in Acts 18 and 28. And of course, James and others in the New Testament. Philip, for example, in Acts 8 35. Then Philip opened his mouth. That is, he opened his mouth to the Ethiopian eunuch. Then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Today, when preachers open their mouths, the scripture should be heard. Jesus Christ should be preached. We notice furthermore here in Acts 17 regarding the scriptural preaching, gay biblical preaching that Paul did in Thessalonica, that he set forth logical argumentation from the scriptures. Is Paul reasoning with the Jews in Thessalonica out of the scriptures, Acts 17 2? He was opening and alleging that Christ was needs of supper and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Opening and alleging means to explain and to give evidence, to prove and to demonstrate. But he did this by the Word of God. And friends, this is exactly what we're trying to do here this week at Bellevue. We're striving to open and allege using the scriptures the word of God. We are to set forth the truth regardless of the opposition to it. A.G. Robertson in his word pictures of New Testament words makes this comment regarding Acts 17 here in the context of verses 2 and 3. Paul was not only expounding the scriptures, he was also propounding, which is the old meaning of allege. His doctrine are setting forth alongside the scriptures quoting the scripture to prove his contention which was made in much conflict. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 2. Probably in the midst of heated discussion by the opposing rabbis who were anything but convinced by Paul's powerful arguments for the cross was the stumbling block to the Jews. 1 Corinthians 1, 23. Now, the Lord opens hearts and minds by doing the kind of preaching that Jesus and Paul did. Is that the kind of preaching that we want? Is that the kind of preaching that we do? Well, I know for us as preachers, and I have confidence in the preachers here today regarding this, but I know it's, it's easier for a preacher just to find something that's interesting and entertaining. But you know, it takes a study to open a ledge from the scripture like Paul did. One is not going to do that, is not going to have the ability to do that. Unless he is daily close to this book. He has to know the Word of God. He has to live in the Word of God. We must be bold in our God, even in the midst of conflict. Now here's another word of Scripture for us to think. It's in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 2. Paul writes to the Thessalonian brethren, But even after that we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention, that is, in the midst of great conflict. You see, we are to preach God's word. We are to be bold regardless of the contention and conflict that we may be facing. Vincent makes here a very important observation regarding the boldness of Paul and his fellow brethren. Their boldness was not mere natural courage, but was inspired by God. You know, friends, that's the greatest courage and confidence and boldness we can ever have. And that is that which comes from God Almighty and through Jesus Christ. Yes, we are to be bold in the preaching of God. There's probably a lot going much going up here. Let us be bold in preaching the gospel of Christ. I'd like to uh, turn over here, though, for a moment to Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 13. And the reason for this is because this word bold or boldness is found in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. And I think this illustrates very well for us as gospel preachers, and yea, all of us as soldiers of the Lord, preachers or not, of how we should be bold for Christ in the gospel. In Leviticus 26, verse 13, we find this word in the Greek version of Septuagint of the Old Testament. The Lord said, I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. 
that ye should not be their bondmen, and I have broken the bands with your yoke, and made you go upright. That has hold your heads up. The Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 18, for the preaching of the cross is none of the parish witnesses, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now we today, those of us who are striving to stand for the truth and to oppose error, you can better know and believe that we're looked upon as foolish to many people, even some of our brethren. But you know, we have no reason to hang our heads down. Yes, we should be at home and bow our heads in prayer. But this boldness here that God gave the children of Israel and that he gave Paul and the brethren, as we read about here in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, that is the boldness that we indeed are to have today. We are to be bold for Jesus Christ. Like Peter and John before the Jewish Sanhedrin, and those Jewish rulers recognized, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Acts 4, 13. We've not been in the literal presence of Jesus in an earthly sense, that's true. But yet, people should see the presence of Jesus in our lives. They should see His impression upon us as we live for Him and walk with Him and study His Word. The confidence and faith in God and His Word will produce the boldness of which we speak. Paul said in Romans 8, 31, If God be for us, who can be against us? Preaching the doctrine of Christ means preaching the kingdom of God. It's Paul went about declaring and teaching preaching the kingdom of God in Acts 20, verse 20. Philip in Acts 8, 12. Paul again in Acts 28, 31. And we read about this in other instances. It means preaching the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 8, 12. And there is salvation in no other name, Acts 4, 12. We are to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3, 17. It means preaching the plan of salvation. And they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God they were baptized, both men and women. And yes, we will inform Phil Sanders and others that the Samaritans did know about what the church was when they obeyed the gospel. And just imagine that we have such teaching that one can only think that he is baptized for remission of sins. He doesn't have to be able to identify the true church or know that he's going into the Lord's church in order to be baptized scripturally. We have such foolishness and false teachings as that going on today being accepted by so-called prominent brethren. But before I sit down and run my stands up, I want to say this. True preachers will not shun from the glory of the whole counsel of God. And actually, verse 27, Paul said to the Ephesians, I was tried not to and declare you all the counsel of God. The American Standard Version, for I shrank not from declaring unto you the whole counsel of God. Vine says here regarding the word shrink or shun from Lupostello to draw back, to withdraw. And that's what a lot of people are doing today. They're drawing back and declaring the whole counsel of God. True soldiers of Christ will not cower, shrink, or draw back from declaring the whole truth. That's the meaning that Strong gives it. He includes to cower or to shrink. You know what we've got today? We've got some cowards preaching. That's what we've got. They cower down from declaring the whole counsel of God. The Father didn't do that. In Acts 20, verse 20, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But it shows you the tongue publicly and from house to house. We must not, we cannot shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God. God is displeased with those who hold back the truth. Paul is the pure from the blood of all men because he refused to do that. Jesus said that we are to teach all things whatsoever he has commanded us. Matthew 28, 20. He said that to the disciples, but the principle is true for us. Those who shrink back from following the Lord in Hebrews 10, 37, and 38 will be lost. So will preachers who shrink back 
from declaring any part of the will of God. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. I know a lot more to be said today about our topic. But friends, that expression, he preaches the truth, should not be used to loosely. Because one does not teach any false doctrine doesn't necessarily mean he preaches the truth. Because the fact of the matter is, if we are unwilling to preach the whole truth, the whole counsel of God, then we're not preachers of the truth. The wise man said, by the truth, and said it not. And Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. Let us go back and stay in the preaching that is of the truth of God. Thank you.